Well, to the growing backlash now against the Democrats' lockdown double standards. Do as I say, not do as I do. These politicians are imposing strict rules on residents and business owners and then ignoring them, doing more or less exactly what they please. Joining me now is New York Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin. Congressman, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jerry. So it is striking, isn't it, that this, the rule, the, the most important rule for many of these Democratic uh, governors and uh, leaders seems to be um, there's one rule for me and one rule for everybody else. What do we do about that? Well, right, well, that causes a lot of resentment. I mean, one of the key principles of leadership is consistency. Uh, and also, in this particular situation where you're enacting uh, restrictions, limitations on behaviors of individuals, of businesses, you need to be able to pass a basic smell test subjectively for that individual or, or business. It has to, uh, it can't lack common sense. Uh, so in the situation where you might have someone enacting a restriction on, let's say, outdoor dining, and in enacting a restriction on outdoor dining, you say that it's a bad situation, and then after you make that statement and you cast your vote, you then go out to eat uh, at a restaurant, uh, that ends up causing resentment amongst your con constituents, and it makes it very difficult. So what you're, you're seeing criticism uh, at the local level and the state level in places like Oregon, Nevada, in New York, in New Jersey, and elsewhere uh, is an issue where people are really starting to push back against those elected leaders, uh, and, and uh, especially not only where it lacks common sense, not passing a smell test, uh, but also where you might have that elected official flaunting, as you pointed out, their own restrictions. And Congressman, it, it, it doesn't seem to be stopping. It doesn't seem to be letting up. I mean, every day we seem to hear new cases. We had the San Francisco mayor, I think, just announced today. We've had so many cases just in the last week alone of, of these uh, Democratic leaders saying, um, you know, these are the rules, but then we discover that they've done something else. What can people actually do to, to push back? Because it looks like, if anything, we're going to get more restrictive measures from, in many of these states over the next month or so. I mean, well, ultimately, you have elected officials, some who might be up for election next November or the November that follows. Uh, sometimes voters, Americans, might have a, a short memory. Uh, and in other cases, uh, they deserve more credit uh, than they get in, in remembering, even if it's a couple years later, what happened. And with regards to these lockdowns, uh, you can speak up, you can advocate, you can mobilize, you can rally. Ultimately, when it, when it comes down to that power to enact a restriction and limitation, the ultimate power in this great country is to throw these people out of office when it's that time uh, to cast that vote. In, in, in the meantime, listen, if you're a small business owner, you might not be able to make it, say, to November of 2022. You band together with other restaurant owners uh, to push back on the substance as to why a restriction might not make sense if, or if you're a place of worship and regardless of whether your capacity is 200 or 2,000 in your state, if you can have the same limit, uh, well, well, maybe you need to push back and, and make your argument publicly and banding together with other churches and bringing lawsuits. And that's why last week you saw the U.S. Supreme Court uh, rule unconstitutional, the restriction on houses of worship in New York State. Yeah, and as you say, the Supreme Court did weigh in on that and weighed in very, uh, in very, very firm language. Do you think there's other legal avenues here, then, again, as these restrictions probably get tighter in some, some, some places, do you think there could be more legal challenges? The Supreme Court did seem to suggest, I mean, it was a, it was a narrow case and it was on the issue of, you know, religious, religious freedom, but the Supreme Court did seem to indicate that it had a majority willing to take uh, a pretty sceptical view of some of these really, really restrictive measures against people's freedoms. Yeah, no doubt that there is room for additional cases as it relates to uh, the right to worship in, in Nevada, where regardless of your capacity limit, you might only be able to have 50, even if you're, even if you might normally hold 200 or 2,000, you can only have 50, or you go to Oregon where you can only have 25. Uh, those cases, uh, and especially as we saw last week with the Supreme Court and in the New York case, uh, they have that. Uh, ability and inclination to rule unconstitutional uh, some of those limitations. As far as these other businesses, one of the added problems is that these local and state elected officials enacting that restriction on the business and on that industry, they're not at the same time talking about how to get that business through the lockdown. 
uh, and they are ignoring, they're not paying attention to the common sense mathematics, uh, the economics of getting that industry through what they're, you know, New York State, if you want to enact a, a restriction on, you know, 10 p.m., you can't go to a gym at 10.30 p.m., that's going to lead to more people going during the day. You've actually increased the density. Uh, as you go state to state, you're seeing a lot of inconsistencies, and I think that those lawsuits, uh, you have strong arguments to be made, even if it's not a First Amendment freedom of religion argument. Uh, I think there are other uh, merit-filled uh, merit arguments to be making where state and federal courts can rule in favor of these local businesses, these industries, because they're not going to survive otherwise. And you're going to see more business owners and others uh, starting to stand up to some of these restrictions because they can't survive otherwise. And finally, Congressman, and just very briefly, looks like we've got some progress. We've reported some progress on the COVID uh, financial relief talks, possible another package coming through. What do you, do you think we're moving closer to a, to, to a deal for, for more financial relief? We'll see. I mean, there is a, there's a strong need for, especially we were just talking about those those businesses. Additional funding for the Paycheck Protection Program is a great example uh, of food assistance and other areas that are being discussed at the table. Education, state and local government funding are uh, as part of the talks. Uh, it, it's really important that the Speaker of the House kind of recalibrate her compass on where exactly her leverage is. She made a, a strategic mistake in not taking the deal just before the election. The President of the United States went from one to 1.6 trillion to 1.8 trillion to 1.9 trillion in his offer, and the Speaker didn't take yes for an answer. She's now in a weaker position, and what would be a really big mistake is if she thinks that waiting until, say, a Joe Biden was President of the United States would help her, yeah, the speaker needs Donald Trump to be helping delivering congressional Republican votes. So the smart thing for the Speaker of the House is to work together in cutting a deal right now, this month, uh, because if she waits any longer, she's going to have even less leverage come next month. And actually, as you point out, uh, Congressman, there are going to be many more of your fellow uh, Republicans in the House, in the, in the new House, in the new Congress that, uh, that meets next month. Congressman Lee Zeldin, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Jerry.